Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, actually, it's afternoon. Let's be accurate here. We're scientists, after all, some of us. Um, it's a great privilege today for me to talk uh, about two friends. Um, it, it's the day that we very proudly inaugurate the inaugurate the uh, Ruth Rothstein Memorial Lecture Series. As many of you know, Ruth Rothstein was uh, our late chair of the Board of Trustees, and she helped this university and guided it uh, uh, with the values that she lived and practiced in both her personal and professional life. Before she came to us, she led the revival of two very important health institutions in the city of Chicago, Sinai Hospital, where she first went as a lab tech, for those of you who uh, sometimes feel possibilities of advancement are daunting. Uh, eventually, she became the uh, assistant to the chief executive officer, and 27 years later, when he retired, uh, they gave her the job because they said, after all, she's been running the place for 27 years, so <laughs> why shouldn't she do it now? And she did that with great success. And then she went on and to the Stroger Hospital, as she retired at the age of 67, went to the Stroger Hospital, rebuilt the Stroger Hospital from the Oak Cook County. And um, she did all of this by, by recognizing that every, you, you can't run an institution in a vacuum, and that every institution has a responsibility to the larger community. She insisted that her institutions grow and uh, meet the needs of their most vulnerable constituents. It's very important that term meets the needs of their most vulnerable constituents. Often in her case it was single mothers and children. And she took the institution into the community, both of them, and welcomed the community into the institution. And above all that she believed like many of us here, I hope you all do, that health care is a fundamental human right, not a privilege. So Ruth would be honored uh, that this lecture series, in particular this forum, Will William Women's Health at the Intersection, Race, Social Position, and Class, bears her name. She understood the devastating social health and economic consequences of racism and discrimination. She went to jail for women's rights to work, for example. Not just for people, but for the entire nation. She understood and modeled the power of inclusion, diversity, and social action. Ruth and today's speaker are kindred spirits. Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, the first woman president of Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia, is the founder and former director of the Center for Women's Health Research at Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee, one of the nation's first research centers devoted to the study of diseases that disproportionately affect women of color. The first African-American woman to lead a freestanding medical school, Dr. Montgomery Rice, extends a vision for Morehouse that includes educating and training clinicians and scientists who will lead the nation in the elimination of health disparities. To hear her talk to our students at lunchtime was a great privilege. Continuing into her role as Dean of Morehouse, where more than 60% of graduates go on to practice primary care and work in underserved areas, she's pledged to grow enrollment, add programs, and build partnerships. You can read her bio, as I'm sure you've all done. There's one word, and that's impressive uh, to, to describe it. Neither Do uh, Dr. Montgomery Rice, who I've known for some years, is Valerie, uh, as I'm privileged to call her a friend, nor Ruth Rothstein let the status quo stand in their way. Both have showed courage in breaking through barriers of gender, race, ethnicity, although I learned at lunchtime that actually gender trumps race when you're on a committee with a bunch of men, uh, uh, to lead change and to improve the health of their fellow human beings here and abroad. It's a privilege and very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice.
Good afternoon. How honored I am to um, be given this inaugural lecture. Dr. Uh, Rothstein, as I know that you all gave her the PhD Life and Discovery Award, so I can call her doctor. I am, love being compared to her as a kindred spirit. She really was a great advocate for women. And I hope that one day that uh, when the time comes appropriately, um, I will be known as an advocate for women, that I have stood on the shoulders of many and opened the door for many. And so I thought it very befitting for me to talk about race, social position, and class and the intersection really with women's health and also added some other slides on some things. Nice to see you. Um, that uh, I kind of heard in my earlier talks with people this morning. I had the opportunity to meet with some people. So some slides I may go through faster than others because I want to have a little bit of time for questions. Health disparities um, in women's health and race. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but as I think about health disparities, as I am evolving as a scientist and as an advocate, I'm really tired of studies that continue to catalog the disparities. We probably don't need another study on disparities. We need to focus our resources on the interventions and making sure that they lead to the outcomes that give us health equity. But when, wherever we look, we can see particularly, and I, and I really like to focus on how people self-report. How do they really think they are doing? Whether you look at this study in 2001, 2008, or whether it was done again in 2014 by the Kaiser Foundation, you will find that underrepresented minorities tend to rate their health as not as ideal. Uh, more of them rated as poor uh, to fair. That's a challenge for us because what you believe sometimes is what you exhibit. We also know that that translates to life expectancy. And so what we claim to see is clear disparities between life expectancy for black and non-Hispanic, and I'm talking about women now, uh, as compared to white non-Hispanics. Now, I'm gonna give you two disease examples that really impact this. And the first one is cancer. This is a cancer incidence by race. And so one of the things that you really should note here is that when you look at the cancer incidence by race per 100,000 women, that blacks and Hispanics have a lower incidence of cancer, okay, per 100,000. But let's just look at breast cancer, a cervical cancer screen, and a colorectal cancer screening. And you can see here that it's not necessarily because of access. Let's look at mammography here. When you look at by African Americans, 70% of them in this year had access and received screening. 70.4% uh, of white women had access and screening. Okay, so it's not necessarily just about access. Same thing can be said about the cervical cancer pap smear test, okay? But when you start to look at the cancer death rates, when you look at breast cancer, you can see the deaths per 100,000 for African-American women are 35 compared to 26 per 100,000 for white women compared to 16 per 100,000. Same level of screening, but then significant difference in the mortality rate. Now, there are lots of different things that may inform this. One of the things that I've spent a lot of my time looking at is mammography issues, and that is not even something that's my field. But when I started the Center for Women's Health Research, we saw such disparity in breast cancer. And I kept thinking about, okay, what could this be due to? And one of the things we figured out is that, first of all, the sensitivity of the screening had not been changed to correlate with the need of the individual. And that is that black women actually have more dense breasts, just like younger women have more dense breasts. And part of it is secondary to how we metabolize estrogen. And so, yes, we've come up with a lot of different ways now that we can improve mammography. One of the things we know now that most black women should always have a digital mammogram, okay, because we have more dense breasts. There's been a lot of good data now that really does show, if I can hit this, that breast density is a risk factor for breast cancer. So, and it's not just because you miss lesions, but there's it seems to be a marker for susceptibility for breast cancer. 
And we also know that there may be some genes that determine breast density that now may be associated with breast cancer. We know there are racial differences to consider. African-American women, increased breast density, we see early age of diagnosis, we see higher mortality. We also see this higher incidence of triple negative. So that's where most of the research is going now, is why is it? Is it correlated to the breast density that may be correlated to how we metabolize estrogen, but then what is it that's happening genetically that give us this increased risk of triple negative? And so when we start to think about how our behavior should change based on this information, this is when we really get beyond just cataloging the difference. This is now how we begin to utilize that information to inform how we're going to fund research and what research we're going to fund. Because we now know that African American women are far more likely to be diagnosed at advanced age. They are far more likely to be premenopausal diagnosis. They have a higher mortality rate. And then they have this triple negative. So if you're talking about making a difference in the life of a woman and lives of women, then you have to fund the research differently now that you know this information. Early detection is always the key to survival. Let's take the case of AIDS. We know that it continues to be a devastating disease for many people in this country. 67% of the country is white, but only 30% of the cases that we see are in whites. Most of the cases are in African American or black, whereas we only comprise 13% of the population. Another disparity, statistic that we know. We now know that black women account for 63% of all new AIDS cases in 2005. And when you look at the AIDS case rate, 45.9, black women 13.8, Hispanics 2.2, white women. When we look historically at what has happened, what you begin to see is that early on in the disease, we had significant mortality. But when the heart regimen, the antiretroviral drugs are, came into play, we saw a significant decrease and the mortality rate for every race ethnicity who was impacted by the disease, right? But what we saw was actually an increase in the black-white mortality ratio. Now this is where we get into access because what you began to see was that even though the drug was available and even though we knew that the drug would decrease the mortality rate, it didn't disseminate out into the communities equally. And so what you actually saw was a reversal. You saw significant more African Americans in comparison to white Americans dying from the disease. And when you actually look at what has happened statistically, you can see in the white population, you see the decrease in the diseases going down, but you see the increase in African Americans going up, even though you have now a medication that has been shown to significantly increase mortality. This is what we call unintended consequences. The absence of attention in federal law and policy to potential unequal diffusion of life-saving treatments, which then results in unequal health outcomes to, that lead to an increase in disparities between blacks and whites. Clearly unintended, but if you know this, what should we do? Let's talk about education and social position. This is educational attainment among women aged 25 to 29 by race and ethnicity. And you can see that clearly we have some differences in who ends up with uh, graduate degrees or gets bachelor degrees or how that impacts uh, whether or not they're going to go to college. Now, how does that impact when we look at degrees awarded to women versus men? You can see across the board the purple being women and the lighter color being men. You can see we see significant differences in who gets doctor degrees, who gets their first professional degree, whether or not they have a master's degree. Definitely more men compared. Why does that matter? Let's look at the intersection between education, income, and health. Multiple studies, big study by Robert Wood Johnson, looking at over from 2001 to 2005. If you have less than a high school diploma, you will clearly see here 
that you will have, the percent of adults who have, will rate themselves as having poor or fair health, okay? It definitely gets less the more education that you get. Life expectancy, we can look at it also based on low education versus high education. High education means that you went to high school and you had at least one to two years of some type of college. The blue color here is white, the, black, the red color here is black, and you can see your life expectancy clearly goes up, whether you're white versus black, if you have more education. Now, what we know is that education confers a great benefit to health status, both through greater knowledge of risk and protective factors, as well as economic resources to facilitate healthy behavior. What supports that? If you look at the effect of additional four years on health, on, on uh, educational health behaviors, what you will see is that here's the base risk. Let's look at smoking, or you can do, see the number of days with five plus drinks, or whether you can look at obesity or the use of illegal drugs. The only thing it doesn't really impact is illegal drugs. So that means smart people like to use illegal drugs, okay? <laughs> we have more access to them, and really that's the truth. And it's the truth. But we make different decisions about whether we smoke or how much we drink or what our diet will entail that will impact our risk of obesity. And when you look at obesity and education, I point you to this other this little slide here because I always want people to be reminded of the disparities that we see in the obesity rate in women based on race and ethnicity. First of all, we are an obese, overweight country. And we as a country need to do something about that. That's just bottom line, can't sugarcoat it, shouldn't sugarcoat it really, for sure. But definitely we really have to face up to that. But we really do begin to see some disparities. So when you look at Hispanic women, 51.8%, African American women, 65.4%, as compared to white women at 442 And no matter what disease you look at, if you are obese, it is a confounder that is going to impact your outcome. And so in a, us as healthcare professionals, we as healthcare professionals must have that hard conversation with our patients. But we definitely see also that if you have more education, you tend to have a less of a chance of being obese as shown here, regardless of what your age group is. So if you had a bachelor's degree or higher, you have a raise of 20 to 24 percent compared to if you were not a high school uh, education per educated person or you had a high, or high school graduate, you see the higher rates here. Now, what does that mean? So we know that additional four years of education influences our health outcomes. We see it in five-year mortality rate. We see it in whether we look at heart disease, diabetes, how we rate ourselves, and the number of sick days that we take. Education does matter. So if we know this, what should we do? Let's look at women's health in class. Percentage of population under 65 without insurance by race and ethnicity. It's, no, um, it's not a surprise to any of us that we see underrepresented minorities have a higher chance of being without insurance. We know that. And we know that it hasn't changed much since 1997. Now, when we do these statistics when, in 2014 or 2015 with the Affordable Care Act, we hope that we see something different here. Okay. We also know that minority children are particularly at risk of being uninsured. And many of them are uninsured for part of the year, but still at some point they are uninsured. And you can see the significant difference when you start to look at Hispanic kids, which is a real factor in this country with the change in demographics as compared to African American kids, as compared to Caucasian kids. Now, what happens to your health status by income? One would expect, as it does, that clearly the, more, the higher your income, the less chance that you're going to rate your health as poor, okay? You're going to begin to rate your health more as excellent. Part of it is because you have more access. You have more opportunity to make different decisions about how you engage the healthcare system. And first of all, you have the opportunity to actually engage the healthcare system, okay? 
And we see this consistently when we look at the health status among people age 25 by family income, whether they rate themselves as having excellent or very good health. But even some people, and this is something to be to, to really tease out in our system here, even some people who have incomes that are greater than 100,000, some of them are still rating themselves as poor. So if we notice, what should we do? So let's talk about the health care reform and the women's health movement. Is it going to matter? I think it is. 15% of U.S. women were uninsured, 12.8 million women in 2000. 20% of the U.S. women aged 19 to 64 were uninsured in 2010. Okay? An additional 16.7 million, 7 million women were underinsured compared to 10.3 million in 2003. The Affordable Care Act will cover nearly all women, reducing the uninsured rate among women from 20 to 8 percent. That's a big deal. And when we look where we have to focus at, we can look at whether we talk about women paying their medical bills, we can look at whether we're talking about them out of pocket medical expenses, we can look at whether or not they make decisions on whether they're going to skip the doc, skip going to the doctor or not get in their prescription field. We can see differences in women overcoming multiple challenges. Okay? Half of 52% of women said that they were confident they would be able to pay or afford the health care they needed if they became seriously ill, compared to other countries where 91 to 77% said that they were confident they would be able to afford the needed care. And so when we think about how the Affordable Care Act impacts women's health, lower costs for women, greater choices for women, quality and affordable care. It eliminates the co-payments for preventive services and it requires plans to cover prevention and wellness benefits at no charge by exempting the cost sharing requirements. That is a big deal for your pap smear or you getting your birth control or you getting your mammogram or getting your colon screen. Now, Let's look at the states that's going to benefit the most from this, and those are some of those states who've decided not to Medicaid, to expand Medicaid, and I happen to live in one of those states. Texas, the uninsured rate is expected to drop from 30.3% to 11%. Florida, from 26 to 9%. Arkansas, from 25 to 6 New Mexico, from 25 to 13 And Nevada, from 25 to 13 that is clearly going to make a difference in the quality of life, and not only the women, but the families that will be served. Again, I share that with our legislators, and I say, so if we know this, what should we do? So where are we headed with this? Class, social position, and race. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about diversity. Diversity is defined in many ways. And we in this country have limited our definitions to race and ethnicity. That is such a limiting way to define diversity. Because what diversity means to me is understanding that each individual is unique. And then we recognize our individual differences and we celebrate them. And this can include race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, age, physical abilities, religious belief, political beliefs, or other ideologies. It is this exploration of these differences that we need to afford each other in a safe, positive, and nurturing environment. And it's also about moving beyond simply tolerating it to embracing and celebrating those differences. Uniformity is not nature's way, okay? Diversity is actually nature's way. If uniformity was nature's way, then we would not look as diverse as we are in this audience today. And so we can unpack this idea of diversity in multiple ways, but I hope that you understand that it really means more than just having a sprinkle of women over here and a dab of color over here. That's not what it's about. 
It really is welcoming people's diverse perspective. It is welcoming people to have diverse interpretations. And so I always tell people, I say, you know, to some people, you know, I went to Harvard, I was a co-op student at Georgia Tech, I went worked at Procter & Gamble. And so for some people, that may be what they see first in me. To others, what they see is that I'm a little country girl from Macon who's made it. Their definition of me making it may be different than someone else's interpretation. But all of them are true. I am a little country girl from Macon who by many standards has made it, but I'm also a student who went to Georgia Tech, who went to Harvard and all of these other things. And so your interpretation adds to my diversity, and that's okay. The, the one thing that I love about diversity is this third run, the heuristics of it, in that it allows us to generate solutions to problems in different ways. As I said to the students at lunch, some people like to talk through with their hands how they're thinking about problems. Others like to write out the solutions first and then talk. We have to give room at the table for all of those people, right? Because that person who is just sitting down meditating on the solution may actually have the best solution. It's just the ones of us who talk too much don't give them the opportunity to necessarily share it. So cognitive diversity and identity diversity. The identity diversity is what we typically see. So people always ask me, well, what do you think of yourself? Do you think of yourself as a woman first or as a black woman first, or a black person first? You know, I don't really think about it that much because you actually see both, I hope, when I walk in the room. <laughs> so I don't know what comes to your mind first. But it's hard for me to separate the two because both of them are who I am. The cognitive diversity, though, is how we think. How we think. And this really does begin to show up. I was an engineering background. In complex tasks like we are doing engineering problems, our tasks requiring creativity and innovation, or dealing with managerial issues. You actually want people at the table who have different life experiences. Because if you take, let's say, how we're gonna increase the number of women getting a pap smear in zip code 30128. Now, you may have come from a different area. Let's say you were a Harvard-trained uh, scientist who's really interested in cervical cancer and you've come up with some methodology that's going to improve the outcome if only women would get a pap smear. You may have a social epidemiologist here who studied that zip code, who understands the cultural differences of how those people in that zip code believe. You may then have another person here who's a grandmother of someone who's died from cervical cancer. If you put them at the table to answer the question, how are we gonna increase the number of women getting pap smears in this area? They may all have the same level of knowledge, but how they present that information to you will be different and they will be coming from different perspectives. And what I say to you is that we need all of those voices at the table to address that question. And that's what cognitive diversity does. It allows people to bring their life experiences to the table to solve complex problems. And I will guarantee you that we will not move the needle forward on eliminating health disparities and creating health equity until we allow everybody a seat at the table. 